joining me now is Ade Ayemi, and you're watching A View from the Top. Ade, thank you very much for joining me. It's always good to have you in the hot seat. It's a I think pleasure we've got to, to be start. here. Thank you so much. I think we've got to start with uh, COVID-19 reality and how the financial services environment has been impacted across the African continent, obviously, given the global nature of this disease. Okay, thank you. I think the first thing we have to uh, start with is the fact that uh, we've lost a lot of people across the world, and we've also lost a lot of people in Africa. And for that, uh, is something that uh, we thought wouldn't uh, happen, or we hope uh, doesn't repeat itself in the future. However, if you stand by where we were in February, going to March, our projection was actually very dire for the continent. Everybody told us that because of the nature of the continent, the density of people in our slum areas, in our cities, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to die as a result of this COVID. Luckily for us, some of those dire predictions has not happened. It's not that we haven't lost. Anybody we lose is one uh, more than we wanted to lose, but we've lost less than we thought we would lose when we started this conversation in February and March. And consequently, because of that prediction in February and March, our government took the right action of trying to protect life over protecting means of livelihood. And those steps that we took to avoid the dangers of COVID actually stalled the economy. And the consequence of that on the financial institutions is that when people don't buy things, when people don't go out to do shopping, when people avoid each other, finance uh, economy actually do tank. And we notice that our economy reduces significantly. And that's have consequences on the financial institutions. At the same time, the demand for people to be able to continue to transact because of the health nature of this issue, the demand was there. And luckily for us, over time, in the last uh, decade, we've actually implemented the role of technology across the banking industry and across the continent, of course, across the globe that allow people to continue to transact even when they cannot physically go to their branches. And those things held up. They were very helpful. They were very useful. The technology that has a convenient power to allow people to work from anywhere, work from home, work from wherever they are, was able to come into force that allow us to continue to service our customers and now our uh, staff and people to continue to work from wherever they are, those things came to fall. Obviously, as we now reflect on the situation where there was scarcity of some things that we should have been able to produce locally that we were not producing, there was scarcity of some services, especially health and education, that people should have been able to get very near to their houses. There was scarcity of a lot of things that as we reflect now on building back better, we now need to ensure that across the continent, we are able to do some things nearer home. I think historically, we all believe that one country can be the manufacturing center of the world. It's no longer something that we can condone in this day and age. So there will be a lot of things that we need to do. Uh, there will be a lot of customers that we need to continue to support, which we've done during the COVID period. Because when a business is good, a business that was good before, and that business is no longer able to produce because of the actions that needed to be taken. That business is not necessarily bad, but it needed to be supported. Our governments have Ade, asked us, and the financial institutions actually provide those supports. Ade, you mentioned, obviously, the GDP contractions that we're going to see across the African continent as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. As the health crisis has turned into somewhat of an economic crisis across the continent, do you think there is a chance that it could also turn into a banking crisis? There's always a chance of something getting bad, but nothing is preordained. 
The responsibility of leaders across the continent and in the banking industry is for us to work together to ensure that the, the crisis that could happen are actually averted. So nothing is preordained. Success is not preordained, and disaster is not preordained either. We all now need to work together, understand the situation, and ensure that the confidence that people have in the banking system is maintained. If we don't do that, then crisis is inevitable. If we do that, then we are able to get out of this with our uh, uh, banking systems intact. So there is work to be done. There's work to be done by the regulator. There's work to be done by all the players in the banking industry. Nothing is preordained, but everything is still possible. Your advice to those trying to manage through this lack of visibility, the lack of certainty that we still have, particularly with a resurgence of COVID-19 happening in, in Europe? Well, uh, if I hear you clearly, the advice of lack of clarity. When there is no clarity, you need to get closer to customer. You need to get closer to the situation. We need to ensure that we are able to collaborate better with each other. We need to communicate with more frequency because that communication will enable us to be able to hear each other clearly and will enable us to be able to collectively chart a course that is reinforcing each other. When there is fright, when there's no communication, there's going to be fright. Everybody will think there's danger. And when we are running away from each other, we are not collaborating, then actually problems can become compounded. So my advice is for us to look at the facts on the face, allow science to guide us, but also understand that this one too shall pass, and therefore we don't need to run for the hills. If we work together, we can do this. If we work against each other, this can do us. You mention digitization and the importance that digitization of the banking system has played to business continuity over this period of COVID-19. Let's talk to the broader digitization trends that we're seeing across the, the African continent and how quickly, Ade, in your opinion, we can achieve financial inclusion. The, the technology to enable financial inclusion is there now. We have enough endpoint computing in the hands of very many people at the price point that they can afford. The mobile phone that is in front of people, the technology embedded there is actually more than the technology that was there in the late 60s when we were planning to take people to the moon. So we do have enough technology now. The, the rationale of inclusion, the right argument for inclusion as a basis of being able to have growth that is going to be enduring because it's inclusive growth, that argument is already won. So what needs to happen now is for all the decision makers, for all of us to move with one voice and understand that it is in the collective growth that is inclusive, that we can have a sustained growth. And therefore, inclusion can actually happen now. And we all need to talk across the board, the banks, the mobile network operators, the central banks, the ministries of finance, and all of us can actually get together and say, listen, you know what? This is primary for us because this is how our economy can grow. This is how this is actually a security matter. Because when people are not included in any growth that they can see, then they don't have vested interest in that growth sustaining. So for me, I think financial inclusion is now a security matter. The technology is there to enable us to do it. The economics actually is rational, and all of the arguments that were there before has been won. So from my point of view, this is something that we can, we can now take forward. And there is enough to enable this to happen, and we all need to work together to make it happen, all of us across the board. You have a presence as Ecobank Group in, in 33 countries uh, across the African continent. 
Can you talk to some of the key challenges you've experienced in expanding your footprint across the continent? We know that every country in Africa has a different set of rules and regulations. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I think the need to have a Pan-African bank is there. And therefore the argument and the rationale to have a presence in multiple countries, that rationale that was espoused multiple years ago, that rationale is there, is still there today. And you are right that as we move far away from the center of the center, because we started in West Africa by the name ECOWAS, I move into other parts of Africa, into Central Africa, into Eastern Africa, into Southern Africa. It begins to look like we are distant players. And I think uh, those kind of views of being distant players in part of the African countries sometimes uh, lead to certain decisions that uh, try to determine who is a local player, who is not a local player. But if you go back to the Africa we want, it's an Africa that is one. And that Africa that is one, irrespective of where in this continent, whether you are from Dakar or from Mombasa, you are from Cairo or you are from Cape Town, or on all the hills and valleys in between, we all have to treat ourselves as one. But yes, I do encounter people uh, looking at EcoBank and say we are West African bank, uh, but um, at least uh, they put the West and they put the Africa. I think as we go into the future, we'll be able to just keep the Africa as an African bank because it is in coming together, and I said that to everybody, that this has to be one market, and that is what uh, informed the African Union. That is what informed the Continental Free Trade Agreement that we just signed. And our future is Pan-African, both EcoBank and for the continent. Mr. Ayayemi, if we were to take EcoBank as an example of a company wanting to expand across the African continent, what would the key challenges be that you've experienced in growing across East, West and Southern Africa? Uh, thank you. Uh, Every good thing that needs to be done uh, sometimes is uh, uh, challenging. And so the EcoBank uh, expansion into the rest of the continent has been challenging as well. Uh, the, when we were doing the West Africa expansion, that was OK, that was easy. As we move to Central Africa, it's beginning to get further away from home. And as we move to East Africa, then we have been uh, branded as uh, a West African bank or a Nigerian bank. And as you go further south, uh, that is much more distant from home. And there couldn't be as much clarity between whether we are an international bank or we are a local bank or we are an African bank. So those kind of things presented its own challenges. Uh, whether it's in our, the, our business model, the kind of uh, way we run our technology, ability to get the right sets of people, uh, culture that is uh, different from place to place, languages itself that is different. I mean, we have four official languages in the, in the institution. We have English, we have French, we have Spanish, we have Portuguese. Now, when you're running a, a business that have to adhere to, of course, the two primary languages are English and French, but I have colleagues that speak uh, Portuguese, I have in, in Mozambique, and I have colleagues that speak uh, Spanish uh, as well. So those are the, some of the challenges uh, that uh, we face and we have to deal with. And you're also trying to offer first world uh, services in a third world infrastructure. That itself is challenging, and to build those infrastructure uh, to the level that we need to build it and the scale and operate it at the same level of scale uh, is quite uh, different and challenging. If you go back to the uh, earlier years, uh, telecoms was pretty scarce across the continent. If you think about it, the whole of East Africa, there was no fiber connectivity from Timbuktu to Cape Town, I mean to, to Durban, until uh, 2008. 
Okay, so there was no fiber connectivity in the whole of eastern seabed of, of Africa, from uh, Djibouti to Durban. There was nothing in between. It's only when uh, Kenya did the uh, Teams project in 2008, and every other person started doing from that point that those uh, telecoms were becoming better. So telecoms was a challenge. Culture is a challenge. Language was a challenge. Business model was a challenge. Uh, but I'm happy today that uh, the people that did this before us uh, spent a lot of time to make sure it is done. It is a treasure for the continent that if we can uh, preserve, we have a basis of being able to trade together as one. Now, now let's use Ecobank as the perfect example to talk to the Africa continental free trade area, given, as we've spoken about, your footprint in 33 countries across the continent. Where do you think we are with regards to the Africa continental free trade area, given the impact of COVID-19, the closure of borders, the inability to trade with one another? Do you think that we have been set back indefinitely or can we get things up and running relatively quickly? Okay, I think some of the border closures uh, that is non-health related is rather unfortunate. Because ultimately, if we want to be able to be regarded as one market, then internal boundaries within those markets needs to get uh, resolved. And hopefully uh, they are being resolved and they will be resolved very, very quickly. Uh, my hope and expectation is that the basis of creating uh, the African Union to start with, the basis of having all the conversation about the continental free trade area to ensure that the rest of the world can regard us as one market of over a billion people, rather than individual fragmented market that is not good, big enough on its own to attract investment. And those things will allow all of us to be able to put together and ensure that the continental free trade area is allowed to go forward. I think it will go forward. The COVID was a shock. And you know, whenever the body suffers a shock, the first thing is to go to the, the primordial defensive mechanism. <laughs> That's what people did. Now that uh, they realized that uh, we are not going to be picking a dead body in Kwarangware, in uh, Nairobi, or in uh, Ajigunle in Lagos and many other places, uh, people will now be able to more soberly think about the impact of COVID, see how we can build back better, see how we can use the COVID in itself as opportunity to create uh, other business model to enable our people to celebrate wealth creation rather than keep talking about poverty alleviation. What will it take now in the current environment to demonstrate that the Africa continental free trade area is a reality in the making rather than just a dream that is unattainable? I think all of us in leadership position, and I say all of us because I'm not in a leadership position, but it's always important to, to ensure that you don't talk about what others must do rather than talk about what all of us needs to do. All of us in leadership position needs to take a step towards ensuring that the conversation is about inclusiveness. That we don't demonize any of our countries. That we ensure that whether it is big country, a small country, that all of them have something to add and we bring that into our conversation. We bring into our conversation within all our countries that no country is too small that has nothing to give and no country is too big that has nothing to receive from another country. So that whenever there is a conversation, we don't start demonizing each other and that leads to violence and trying to, uh, to demonize uh, each other and create violence in our various countries. Because the trade and jobs that it creates and the need for mobility of people, all of those things work side by side. And if we believe 
in the fact that uh, all Africans need to be one. And if we are one, the benefit is much bigger for all of us. And whoever is uh, not getting the benefit in the first instance, we all need to come together and help those. Because there will be losers, there will be winners. The winners need to be prepared to share the benefits of winning. And the losers need to be supported to make sure they don't lose everything. It is in that kind of uh, scenario of leadership that I want to see all the leaders of the continent start having that kind of conversation. Because if the leaders of the continent begin to talk about only the boundaries of their countries, then it's going to be difficult for all of us to be able to get this done. To get it done... Again, uh, Mr. Ayanyemi, operating, operating in 33 countries, and I come back to, to the fact that you, you do have that footprint, perhaps you can give us a sense if you believe the political leadership is there to ultimately enable the free movement of goods, services, and people, which would obviously make the Africa continental free trade area a reality. We, we are not where we're supposed to be. So there's still some journey, there's still some travel uh, to, to be done. There is some education that our leaders need to give to their own people. And some of our own leaders need to convince themselves about the reality of this, but I think it is imperative. But I say, as Ecobank, and um, when there was a conversation about the micro, small, and medium-scale enterprises across Africa, that need to build back better, we step forward. We step forward as Ecobank. We work with African Union, AUDA, to make sure that we can convey the rest of our colleagues of the importance of being able to deal with the post-COVID era of the micro, small, and medium-scale enterprises in a way that makes them a better player post-COVID than they were pre-COVID. And we did not just think about Ecobank in Togo or Ecobank in the 33 countries where we are present, by the way. We expanded that opportunity for discussion and dialogue across the continent and reach out to our brothers in Cairo, our brothers in Egypt, our brothers in Sudan, and our brothers in South Africa, and sisters, of course, to make sure that the conversation is one conversation across the continent. And I think that is how, as we go forward, we'll be able to do better. That is the way Ecobank has approached it, and that's the way Ecobank, working with others, are approaching it as well. So many say that small, medium enterprises across the African continent, uh, their uh, acceleration, their survival is crucial to alleviating Africa's poverty situation. How do you think small, medium enterprises have come through COVID-19, given again, we aren't through the pandemic, there's still that uncertainty we spoke about at the top of this discussion. But your sense of, of, again, a view from the top, looking at small, medium enterprises across the continent, what is your sense of the, the survival rate to this point? Okay. My, my sense is that um, it's been tough for them. Um, that's the reality. Because remember, those micro businesses are people that eat what they uh, realize every day is what they eat every day. They don't have that much savings, especially the micro ones. We call them a gig economy. So that was challenging for them because they couldn't go to their places of work. But we are beginning to see them coming back, going to places of work, realizing that they need to work so that they can, they can eat. The way we've tried to structure the conversation is that ca cash is not the first thing they need. They need training. They need opportunity to be created for them. So when we started this micro, small, medium scale enterprises, uh, working on it together with the African Union and other institutions, is to say we need to do training for them first. And we created uh, an academy where EcoBank supported, African Union supported, uh, McKinsey supported, some of other uh, players are also stepping in to do training, to do organizational development, so that, again, they can learn and also link them to market and link them to each other. 
Because sometimes uh, people don't know that, uh, you know, there is enough uh, leather in northern Nigeria that you can use to make good bags in Kotonou. Of course. Uh, so it's important to start linking people together and also link them to the international market. Because if we only produce on, uh, for ourselves alone, that is not, of course, that will alleviate poverty, but that does not create uh, wealth. To create wealth, we need to link all these micro, small, medium scale enterprises to market where they can export their goods and they can get it to the right standard and therefore be able to create the right wealth. Ade, I think it's time to draw the conversation to a conclusion. And at this point, I'd like to ask for you to share your advice with the Cybos audience. Uh, engaged in this interview, given, again, the uncertainty, the lack of visibility uh, with regards to where we will find ourselves globally and, of course, where the African continent will find itself in that global equation. From your leadership stance, what is your, your view at this juncture? Okay. I think we've... Uh... There has been a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, and we've lost a lot. But what we've lost is the reason why we all have to now say, okay, let's step back. In honor of the people we lost, how can we build back better? Yes, there's lack of visibility on what is going to happen uh, tomorrow, but if we look further than tomorrow, the future of the world and the future of our continent is in working together. It's in that working together that we'll be able to create a better economy, a better social situation. Individually, you know, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. This is the time that the world needs to come together and communicate with each other. Because if we want to lock down ourselves in our individual countries, both physically and mentally, then it will be difficult for us to get out of this in a better way. But if we can imagine a future in which every person can actually mentally open himself up and say this Africa and this world belongs to all of us and we need to create enough opportunities so that strife is going to become something that we go away. That we were able to trust each other to work together. It is in getting these things done that we'll be able to build back better. Yes, the COVID has been challenging. The responses have been appropriate in some situations. The responses has been poor in some situations, but we need to forgive ourselves. But we cannot be looking backward every time we need to look forward. And we need to take our destiny in our hands with the hope that tomorrow will be better than today. But for that tomorrow to be better than today, it's not just hope, it's hard work, it's tolerance, it's trying to find a way for leaders to emerge beyond the confines of their own country. Every mind needs to be opened up, not just physically, but mentally. Thank you. Ade, as I said at the top of our interview, it's always a pleasure to speak to you, sir. Ade Ayeyemi is the group CEO of EcoBank. Thank you for having me.